Podcasting live from the School of Athens, this is Europe and the People Without History with Mr. Olson, everyone's favorite AP World History Review Service. So today we're going to take a deep dive into one of the most important topics in all of world history. We're going to be talking about the establishment and development of the Spanish Empire and the Colombian Exchange that went along with it. So before we do that, let's go ahead and contextualize this. So you might remember if your teacher has incessantly and repeatedly told you that Constantinople fell in 1453, which forced Europeans to look for another route to India and the East, the East Indies because they wanted to find things like spices and find more Christians. They needed to cut out the new Ottoman middlemen, and so they had to look for a new route. This led, of course, of among other people, Prince Henry the Navigator of Portugal, to start seeking an all-water route. The first explorer that really makes headway into this is Bartolomeo Diaz, who rounds the southern tip of Africa, makes it uh, almost into the Indian Ocean, but then gets blown back. Anyways, Spain follows by sending Columbus westward to find east, and he runs into the New World, which will be the topic of our discussion today. Now, this leads to a fight between two Catholic empires, Portugal and Spain, and the Pope sorts it all out with a Treaty of Tor Tordesillas, basically granting the known world to Portugal, most of it at least, and the new world to Spain. Now, it took Spain a little bit of time to really cash in on the riches, but that's what we're here to discuss today. Following Columbus was Vasco da Gama, who did successfully find that all-water route to India from Portugal, thus allowing Portugal to get a head start on all of this. Anyways, the Spanish are eventually going to cash in because they're going to take over the Aztecs and the Inca. Now, you might remember from the previous period that the Aztecs were a tributary empire in what is now Mexico, and they had made a lot of enemies around them because... They forced them to pay tribute and took a lot of prisoners to sacrifice. Anyways, the Aztecs had built this magnificent city at Tenochtitlan in the middle of a lake where they used chinampas and other uh, advanced uh, agricultural techniques to grow enough food to support a population of between 250 and 500,000. The Incas started their empire in the Andes of Chile, Peru, and basically carved out what I would argue is the most amazing empire in all of world history. They had a bunch of roads that were complex and through the mountains. They grew potatoes, and they were great. Anyways, the story is, of course, going to start with nothing other than European greed. So Europe is on the hunt for the three Gs. They want to bring glory to their country because European, uh, new, newly emerged European kingdoms are at constant conflict with one another. And so if they can find something that the others don't have, glory to one's kingdom. They also want gold because, you know, gold. And they also want to spread Christianity. Now, eventually, when they find this new world, and so we're talking predominantly about the Spanish now, they are able to subjugate the peoples that live there because of three phenomenon, guns, germs, and steel. Now, that is, of course, a uh, phrase that's made popular by the uh, geographer Jared Diamond's Pulitzer Prize winning book, but of course, the guns that the natives don't don't have, the germs that the natives are not uh, immune to, and the steel that the natives do not have allow the Spanish in upper hand, and despite their much lesser numbers, they're able to take over these empires. We'll go ahead and start with the most important of them, according to me, uh, and that would be the germs part. Obviously, the most influential of all of the diseases brought over by the Spaniards was smallpox. Don't really know exactly where it started, but it's likely that it was carried over in large number on slave ships. And then when it got here, it just ran its course. Smallpox is, of course, an incredibly dis disgusting disease that uh, causes uh, various um, pus-filled growths to uh, emerge all over the skin, and when they pop, they can become incredibly infectious and, of course, lead to death. Now, this image is one that you usually will see associated with it because it is one drawn by the Native Americans to record their plight. Now, of course, because of diseases, the population of the Americas, particularly in this graph we have Central Mexico, went down tremendously. Now, the movement of diseases is a part of a bigger phenomenon known as the Columbian Exchange. And if I cannot emphasize anything more than this. The Columbian Exchange is something that is asked about on free response questions on the AP World History Test all the time. So knowing it, understanding it, and sorting it out is incredibly important. And it's basically defined as the transfer of various flora, plants, fauna, animals, and diseases and people 
across the Atlantic Ocean. Now it can go either way, okay? For example, New World crops, so things that originated in the Americas, like corn, tomatoes, potatoes, vanilla, tobacco, um, rubber, and others, they were taken to Europe. Funny side, side note, when tomatoes showed up in Europe, Europeans thought they were poisonous. Go Europe. Go Europe. Anyways, I've got one friend who thinks that he knows what the most important cro crop is. Do you I think you know? I have blood in my veins. My life, it's potato. <laughs> in your, uh, your working life and your uh, living, it's always potatoes. I dream of potatoes. When we are going to harvest in your mind and in your heart, you feel that you are going to export the potatoes and you are not going to see it anymore. That hurt. The family thinks always from morning to evening about the potatoes. Uh, that's a lot of uh, love for some potatoes. I would, of course, classify potatoes as a devil food. You should stay away from those. Unless they're the sweet variety, because sweet potatoes are good. Now, back to emphasizing things about these new world plants that you need to know. So, potatoes go to Ireland and uh, create a food staple there. Yes, that's right. Before the Columbian Exchange, no potatoes in Ireland. Sorry to disappoint you, Irish people. And tomatoes go to Italy, which means no spaghetti, no pizza before the Columbian Exchange. However... What crops like corn and potatoes are able to do, since they have a higher caloric va value, um, you know, for their size and, and uh, for how much energy goes into making them and cooking them, they're able to support larger populations. And so Europe, which had been basically living off of wheat and grain products, are able now to um, support a growing population. This is, of course, important because we're right on the cusp of an industrial revolution. Now, there are some old world plants that make their way across the Atlantic Ocean and are cultivated in the Americas. So this would be your citruses, your grapes, your onions. Most importantly though, bananas, which will be the subject of various banana republics in Latin America, and two others, sugarcane and coffee, which are arguably the most important crops to make their way across the Atlantic Ocean during this time because they, of course, will be the thing that brings the most slavery. Anyways, you might want to take a picture of this here map, or you can find it easily online by Googling Columbian Exchange, because it sort of tells you the things that were moved across the ocean dur during the time. So we've emphasized sugarcane, we've emphasized coffee, tobacco is another one which is important because Europeans get hooked on it, which is kind of funny. Um, it's sort of like a gift from the uh, Americans to the Euro Euro the Europeans. It's sort of like a, you know, thanks for the smallpox, here's some lung cancer uh, thing going on there. But all jokes aside, the other thing that was incredibly devastating to both the environment and the way of life in the Americas was the introduction of livestock. If you remember something about uh, the beasts of burden in the Americas is there weren't any. You only had the llama and the alpaca, which are not very good draft animals. And so if you bring over cattle, sheep, oxen, pigs, and horses, particularly the oxen and the horses can now pull implements on farms, and therefore you can remake the landscape. And so you have a fundamental change. Now, of all those animals, sheep are the most destructive because sheep are responsible for causing more organisms to be extinct than humans. And that is really saying something. Anyways, to drive home the points about I've made about the Columbian Exchange, here's our old friend John Green. We're revolutionary. Let's go to the thought bubble. First of all, these animals, especially pigs, completely remade the food supply. Pigs breed really quickly, they eat anything, and they turn into bacon, which made them heroes to the new world, just as today they are heroes to the internet. Here's how quickly pigs breed. When Hernando de Soto arrived in Florida in 1539, he brought 13 pigs. By the time of his death, there were 700. That was three years later. The abundance of meat and plentiful land for agriculture and grazing meant that Europeans in the Americas very rarely experienced famine. And despite what you may have learned about religious and political freedom, the main reason Europeans came to America was to eat. Large European animals also changed the nature of work in the Americas. Before Europeans, the largest beast of burden was the llama, and at best it could carry like 100 pounds. This meant that for the long distance travel that the Inca engaged in, the primary transportation animal was Incas. 
Oxen, when combined with their plows, made it possible to bring more land under cultivation and also made transportation easier and more efficient. And plus, European animals remade culture. The grossly stereotypical American Indian, like from the movies, riding the Great Plains with an eagle feather headdress and war paint, well, he didn't exist before the Columbian Exchange because there were no horses for him to ride. And the introduction of horses allowed many Native Americans to abandon agriculture in favor of a nomadic lifestyle because riding around hunting buffalo made them far richer than farming ever had. Thanks, Thought Bubble. While animals and diseases completely reshaped the New World, it was New World plant. Okay, so obviously animals are a really, really big deal in the ranch, ranch, or that becomes known as the Columbian Exchange. Uh, but here are just some things that uh, have sort of been transformed by the movement of these goods over the Atlantic Ocean in the wake of Columbus's voyages. You would have no oranges in Florida if it weren't for the Columbian Exchange. You would have no coffee in Columbia. You would have no chocolate in Switzerland. You would have no cattle in Texas. Now, there are environmental consequences of all this movement. For example, the introduction of sugarcane and coffee both of which are cash crops that require a lot of slave labor, they absolutely destroy the environment. And because Europeans are into making money from them and also, you know, eating or consuming them, uh, they grow them in abundance. And as a result, it has a detrimental impact on the land. I've also already reminded you that the animals come, they get loose, wild, and they destroy the landscape. So Europe, thank you for ruining the environment of the Americas. Now, there are economic chain changes that result from uh, the Spanish con conquest and the ensuing Colombian exchange. For example, they needed to grow more products, so they needed to figure out a new labor system to put in place in an effort to extract as many resources as they possibly could. This la labor system becomes known as the encomienda system. The encomienda system usually is described as like a slave system, but it doesn't really work that way. Okay, so encomienda was essentially a deal between a Spanish person settling in the New World, otherwise known as an encomendero, and the king or queen of Spain. So technically, the land b belonged to the king and queen of Spain, and therefore everything on the land belonged to the king and queen of Spain, which means that the king and queen of Spain claimed the right to the Native Americans. So the encomendero, or the Spanish settler, went over to the New World, said, King and Queen of Spain, I need workers. Can I borrow some of your Indians? And the King and Queen of Spain would say, sure, but you have to turn them into Christians if you're going to borrow them. Now, the turning them into Christians usually ended up like this. Nevertheless, encomienda system, not that good if you're a Native American. Pretty good if you're the King and Queen. Really good if you're the encomendero. So that's labor system, labor system number one. More on labor systems to come in future classes. Another economic change was that the Spanish eventually, because they're so persistent, end up finding a ton of precious metals. Particularly, they find a ridiculous amount of silver in a mountain in South America called Potosi. The mountain of Potosi is literally... Uh, considered to be a mountain made of gold. Now, the Spanish extract so much silver because this is what they use for their currency, and they run into an issue because they extract so much of it so fast that it eventually, they run out of the good stuff that's easy to uh, boil down and turn into, in, into coins. So they have to figure out a new way, but don't worry. All they do is mix it with mercury, and then you're able to extract the mercury in a process called amalgamation. Now, this is, of course, uh, not good because mercury is poisonous, but don't worry, none of the Spanish were doing that work anyways. So some of you might come across during your time in class this very difficult and hard to understand uh, flow chart. Now, when you see this, you will see that the flow chart is of silver flowing from the Americas to other places. The most important thing to note about this silver is that the silver did not just go back into Western Europe. It went to several other places, okay? A lot of it did go back to Western Europe, don't get me wrong, but a lot of it also ended up in East and South Asia, which means China, Japan, these places are benefiting from Spanish conquest and Spanish extraction of precious metals. Okay. So it's not to just say that all this, this, uh, gold and silver went right back to Europe. Uh, uh, it was a worldwide phenomenon. Again, to emphasize this point, here you go. Having to work in the mines. You can see why I'm struggling to be festive. Let's go to the thought bubble.
So Spanish mines in the Americas produced over 150,000 tons of silver between the 16th and the 18th centuries, over 80% of the world's supply. Spain became the richest nation in Europe, and Spanish silver pesos became the de facto currency. But the Spanish royal family does not appear to have understood inflation, and the huge influx of silver caused skyrocketing inflation, and since they never set tax rates to account for it, they collected the same amount of money 60 years after the discovery of silver, but that money was worth a fraction of what it once had been. And in general, it's not clear that Spain benefited much from the discovery of silver. Rich countries have a way of finding their way into expensive and not totally necessary wars, and Spain was no exception. While empire wasn't the central cause of Spain's many 16th century wars, it sure did fund them. So in 1519, which was a heck of a year for Spain, Charles V united the kingdoms of Spain and Austria by being named head of the Holy Roman Empire, so-called because it was not holy, not Roman, and not an empire. Charles had this dream of a unified Central Europe, which was constantly being thwarted by German nobles who had a dream of a non-unified Central Europe, and eventually Charles V's ambitions were shattered, and he gave the Austrian half of his kingdom to his son Ferdinand, and gave Spain with the American stuff to Philip in 1556. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So Philip II didn't only inherit all of Spain's whole... Okay, so Spain obviously benefits a lot from the silver because it's able, it helps them uh, buy things, but then it also goes into funding a lot of unnecessary wars and they don't account for inflation. So as it happens, Noble spent so much money that it crashed the economy, almost bringing it to a complete standstill. Hilarious how too much money actually crashes the economy. Now, the last economic change that I want to emphasize for, for you right now is that of sugarcane. Obviously, uh, the Caribbean and Brazil uh, are places that grow sugarcane more effectively than most other places. This would be something that we that you should talk more about when you discuss uh, slavery at length, but let it be known that sugarcane is an incredibly, incredibly labor-intensive crop. It requires... Uh, once the cane is cut down, it needs to be juiced almost immediately so it doesn't mold or rot. And since that's the case, it requires a, a lot of strenuous work. And as a result of this, you need a lot of people to do that work and you need to keep them motivated. And so why not intimidate your slave labor force by making examples of other people? Usually the average life on a, on a sugar plantation was three years. That means that you got imported from Africa and you lived for three more years on average. That is insane. Now to dispel some myths, you can see that this is a map of the worldwide uh, movement of slaves during this time period. Again, should be the topic of another uh, class in this course. Uh, but most of the slaves did not end up in North America, despite what some people might tell, tell you most slaves went where there was sugar. All right, so economic changes, one, encomiendas, two, silver, three, sugar. Now, let's talk about the political changes that occur. Well, the most important political changes of the Spanish showing up are the fall of the Aztecs and the fall of the Inca. Let's deal with them in that order. So you might remember that Hernan Cortez is the Spanish conquistador that shows up on the doorstep of the Aztec Empire and somehow figures out a way, despite a tremendously lesser army, to conquer what was then one of the most impressive empires in the world. So he is able to infiltrate the, the capital city of Tenochtitlan and manipulate the emperor Montezuma in uh, to basically trusting him so long that he can bait and switch and then eventually bring the empire to its knees. Now, he did not do this without help, though. So uh, it's important that we understand the context in which Cortez conquers. So for that, I give you this short clip. Let's take a closer look at Tenochtitlan, its full name being Mexico Tenochtitlan. One of the Spanish soldiers, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, wrote this about his initial impression of the city. We were amazed on account of the great towers and pyramids rising from the water, all built of masonry. And some of our soldiers even asked whether the things that we saw were not a dream. The city was unlike anything in the old world. It would have been bigger than any city in Spain, with a population of at least 250,000, possibly more, making it one of the world's largest cities. The Spanish particularly found the botan... Okay, so you can see that uh, the Spain roll, roll up on Tenochtitlan. It is incredibly impressive to them. They react with awe 
And hopefully you remember that there are several mar marvels about this city. Chinampas, large pyramids, large open marketplaces, compulsory public education, and these causeways that allow people to get to and from the city. Now, if we're going to talk about the Spanish conquest, we need to understand why. What went in to the Spanish being able to conquer? And so let's continue this discussion now. We command easily. All of this puts into perspective how the final war of the Mexica was doomed. The Mexica and Spanish were not fighting the same war. The Mexica wasted precious time capturing Spaniards or their native allies in battle, while the Spanish focused on killing as many soldiers as possible. Even when the war was lost, the Mexica would have assumed a bitter negotiating process was about to begin, where the Spanish would demand tribute, just as the Mexica did when they conquered. They could never imagine that their entire civilization, along with their gods and emperors, would be snuffed out. So was it just weapons? No, it was definitely not weapons. There, It's important to recognize that actually the Aztecs had a lot of enemies that lived around them that were able to, that were willing to ally with Cortez and the Spanish to help bring the Aztecs down. But also different ways of life, different understandings of how warfare and negotiation was to proceed. It was not just weapons. Okay, now let's move on to, to the Inca to talk about what happened there. So the Inca were conquered by a conquistador named Francisco Pizarro. At the end of uh, their reign, they had a leader named Atahualpa, who is who uh, actually just came to power like the day before the Spanish show showed up. But anyways, at when the Spanish were in the midst of trying to bring the uh, Incan Empire down, they set up a city called Lima, which is one that you might have heard of. Anyways, they are able to convince Atahualpa to uh, give them as much gold as can fill the room uh, if uh, the Spanish promise to spare his life. And the Spanish, of course, don't do that. Um, but this is more complicated. How was a Spanish fleet of so little able to conquer the biggest and most impressive army of the New World? Well, confusion. ...south and have his glorious coronation. Pizarro and his men had planned to emulate Cortes. They would capture Atahualpa, thus cutting off the head of the Inca Empire and paralyzing it. Atahualpa, as Sapa Inca, was supreme ruler of the empire, and it could not function without him. Pizarro had hidden his men in the buildings surrounding the square, and stationed the artillery and arquebuses on the far side of the square, ready to fire. Like too many fans in a tiny football stadium, the Inca troops crowded into the square, which had only two narrow exits. Not a single Spaniard could be seen. As the sun began to set, nothing could be heard in the square except for a slight breeze. The fear inside the stone buildings was incalculable. Pedro Pizarro said, I heard that many Spaniards urinated on themselves without noticing it from sheer terror. Eventually, two men appeared from the buildings and approached Atahualpa. Vincente de Valverde, a Dominican friar, and an inexperienced native translator. The friar read the following to Atahualpa. I request and require you to recognize the church as your mistress, and as governess of the world and universe. And if you do not do this, with the help of God we shall come mightily against you, and we shall make war on you everywhere and in every way that we can, and we shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and his majesty, and we shall seize your women and children, and we shall make them slaves to sell and dispose of as his majesty commands. And we shall do all the evil and damage to you that we are able. And I must insist that the deaths and destruction that result from this will be all your fault. This was the Requerimiento, a document read aloud to the native peoples of the New World, informing them of Spain's divine right to conquer these lands in the name of God. Valverde then approached Atahualpa and offered him a Bible. Atahualpa had heard reports of the men's fascination with these objects, but he had no way to contextualize what this was or how to interact with it. He had had enough with these foreigners now, and their disrespect for the Inca diplomatic customs. Atahualpa scolded Valverde and the Spanish for stealing from warehouses and killing Inca chiefs 
and proceeded to toss the book aside. All right, so that's nice, huh? So good of this Hannish to take into consideration, uh, you know, other people. And it's funny because some still use the Spanish requirement as a cudgel today. Anyways, some people think that to Christians, the world is not their, their home, but it doesn't really seem like that in the interaction between Atahualpa and the Inca. Now, Eventually, the Inca are going to be brought down and there's going to be, um, you know, their empire falls uh, after seri uh, several series of um, attempted resistance. Uh, for example, their, the last Incan empire named Tupac Amaru, yes, the man who, uh, the namesake for tu Tupac, uh, leashes, unleashes a resistance in the 1700s, but it, of course, is thwarted and the Spanish are able to continue ruling uh, over what was the most glorious empire in the Americas. Now, question for you to ponder, what, what do you think was a bigger deal? Fall of the Aztecs or fall of the Inca? Chances are you've heard of the fall of the Aztecs and you understand that one, but chances are you also know much less about the fall of the Inca and much less about the Incan Empire uh, on, on the whole. That's for a couple different reasons. One, the road to El Dorado. Two, the fact that the Aztecs had writing. And three, because the Inca were kind of uh, an empire that was in more isolation than, than the Aztecs. And so we just, we learn more about the Aztecs than we do about the Inca, but I'm here to remind you, don't forget about those Inca. Do not sleep on them. Now, after these successful conquests, the Spanish are able to set up a, a global empire that looks like this. You can see that it is, it is in their treaty of or to CS zones. Now, how are they going to, or, or how are they going to administer this? Well, they implement what's known as viceroys, which are basically people that oversee um, Spanish colonies. So um, you have the viceroy of New Spain, and you have the viceroy uh, of Peru, and it's sort of like the the northern part and the southern part of the empire. So the viceroys are the governors, and they oversee these new dominions, if you will. Now, not all Spaniards had, uh, you know this death drive and to kill Native Americans. There was one who stands out among all others, and he is a favorite to be asked about on AP test. His name is Bartolome de las Casas, and he was a Spanish encomendero, so he comes over initially owning an encomienda, but then he sees all the horrible things that the Spanish are doing to the Indians and then starts writing on behalf of the Native Americans. He writes an influential book in the 1560s called The Destruction of the Indies, which chronicles how the population declined so fast and the role that the Spanish played in that. Now, there are several changes that occur when the Spanish set up their empire and start to exert their influence over society, one of which is changes to religion. Now, hopefully earlier in this class, you've learned about religious syncretism, which is the ability of one religion when coming into contact with another one to influence its ways and its practices. So the Spanish come over and they implement Catholicism um, um, very forcefully. And then over time, we see something interesting happen. The Native Americans adopt aspects of Catholicism, but then sort of change it in their own uh, ways. For example, an influential American uh, religious figure, the Virgin de Guadalupe, is basically the reincarnation of the Mother Mary only in the figure of, uh, you know, more Aztec light. So basically the Indians or the Amer the indigenous people of the Americas have embraced aspects of, of uh, Catholicism and blended it with their own religious beliefs to carve out new religious figures. This same process happens with African slaves who bring their tra traditional African religions over and it gets mix mixed with Christianity. And the most famous product is voodoo or vodun, which is a religion that can often be seen in the Caribbean and is actually part of uh, the influential ideas that will bring about the Haitian Revolution. Now, in light of social changes, the most important social change to uh, be aware of is the implementation of what some scholars and historians call the Casta system. Now, the Casta system was one in which there was a social hierarchy based on skin color and based on background. So at the top of this hierarchy, you had the Peninsulares, or these were people that were born on the Iberian Peninsula. Below them, you had the Crioles, or people that were born uh, in in the New World, but were descendants of parents that were born in Spain. Below them, you had half white, half Indian, mestizos, or half black, half white, mulatos. And then you had below them the African slaves and the Native Americans that oftentimes were getting lumped in the whole in, into groups. Now, this casta system has been memorialized uh, and sort of uh, m m uh, 
been seared into the memory of people because of various Costa paintings like this one. It literally created a box and or a um, like a, a designation classification, if you will, uh, for different groups of people. So I would look and I would see. So here we have a Spanish and an Indian is a mestizo, a mestizo and uh, a mestizo man and a Spanish woman. Kawitzo. And so you have all of these different uh, categorizations, okay? So many so that you even have a lobo and a Chinese person. So you can see that there are a lot of different groups that become of this. Now, I should bring up the question, how legitimate is this and was it really um, an impact of everyday life? And so here's some interesting takes on the caste system or the casta system in the new world. So the first part says, often called the, the Hasta system, there was in fact no fixed system of classification for individuals, right? Individuals uh, had considerable fluidity in society as individuals often identified themselves rather than the law. Now, sometimes the law did apply to them. For example, mestizos, who were half white, half Indian, could be subject to the Spanish Inquisition and like have their fingernails pulled out. But Indians would not have been. Okay, so mestizos would try to pass as Indians in order to avoid the Inquisition. They would want to pay a tax so that they didn't have to deal with uh, the Spanish Inquisition, which oftentimes had disastrous results. Now, again, it's mem it's sort of memorialized by these paintings, right? The one that's pictured in the, in the back of the picture there, or these ones. Let's look, let's look at this one. Now, who is likely to have a painting like this just chilling in their house? A uh, Spanish person of... of uh, higher class, or someone at the bottom of society. Chances are these paintings were made for Spaniards or for mestizos, higher ranking mestizos, to hang in their house, right? This shows happiness on the part of uh, the Indian wife. They have this child together and life is great. Uh, however, like I said, these paintings are the production of elites in New Spain for an elite view viewership, sometimes in Spain or sometimes in the Americas. Why would they do this? Well, to convince to convince others that actually society functions fantastic. And it further reinforces the idea that there exists a harmonious balance between the different groups in society. But in reality, these different groups would have found themselves mingling all the time. Was it stratified legally? Yeah, sure. Was it stratified economically? Definitely. But in everyday life, would it have been this regimented and stratified? I would argue not. Now, the last thing that I'm going to say to you uh, is that the Spanish are not the only ones who carve out uh, empires in the New World, but we will figure out who else did it and what that was like later on. For now, this is your Buddha signing off.